guy up here. Woo, there it is. All right, here we go. We're ready. How are we doing? Good. John chapter 15, that's where we're going to be at in the text today. Um, for some of you, you might recognize me about 40 pounds ago and 10 years ago and no beard, uh, but my name's Josh Rozek. Uh, I, oh, she's excited. All right, here we go. Uh, it's good to be back here at Bridgepoint. Uh, Bridgepoint's a very special place in, in my heart, holds a very special place in my heart because this was the place where I kind of grew up in my faith. I, I came to faith in Jesus as a teenager and I was just a broken and lost kid. Uh, and this church really took me in. I was baptized here, I was discipled here, I went on uh, mission trips here to church camp here. Uh, and this is just a very cool place. And I'm, I'm very honored that Craig would have me come and speak uh, to you this morning. And I, I'm hoping and praying that the Lord will really. Uh, use what we're going to be talking about here in John chapter 15 uh, in your life in a very special way. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be there. Uh, the past six to seven years leading up to this point, uh, I've been a, a youth pastor, been working in student ministry. Uh, me and my wife, actually, this year, we moved back from the Detroit area. We were uh, pastoring, uh, youth pastoring at a church up there. Uh, we blinked and we had three kids. We started out with twins, and then a year and a half later, our youngest, Caroline, was born. So we're like, hey, let's get closer to family. We need some help. So we moved back here to Bedford, uh, and uh, we are, are just living here, waiting on what's next. Um, but when, when I was a youth pastor, when I got those opportunities to preach in big church, right, the youth pastor occasionally every couple, uh, a couple times a year would get to preach in big church, I thought about what are the things, what are the topics, what are the scriptures that I found so you know, beneficial, so life-changing in my life as a young adult, as an adult, that I wish I would have heard when I was a teenager, or at least I wish I would have listened better to as a teenager, right? Uh, what are those scriptures? I want to uh, teach on those things. And I, I think back about the kid that I used to be in those middle school and high school years. Maybe you can think back about that in your life. Scary times, right? Scary to think back about how, who you were back in those days. Maybe you didn't know Christ back then. Maybe your life was completely different back then. But I think about what are the things that I wish I would have taken to heart? What I, what I wish I would have applied to my life as I was living out those days. Because when I was in high school, I, I surrendered my life to Jesus my sophomore year of high school. And I was a kid, I'm telling you what, I was a kid was so far away from Jesus. I grew up in a home where we, we didn't even talk about the Bible. I, I had no idea about the Bible. Literally, like, maybe knew about Jesus and maybe I heard about David and Moses. Had no context of what scripture was. But Jesus got me when I was a sophomore. And when I, when I went through those high school years, I, I, I got to my senior year, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. Actually, I remember sitting up, not on this stage, but it was somewhere over there in the old building. And we had Senior Sunday, and everyone, all the seniors, was kinda, they were kind of going through what they wanted to do with their life, what school they're going to go to, what major they're going to have, what career. And I remember just standing up there, they handed me the mic and saying, my name's Josh Rozak, and I have no idea what I want to do with my life. And it was very true in that moment. I, I had no idea. But I knew one thing, because this was all so fresh and new to me, I wanted to glorify God with my life. I wanted to grow in my, my faith. And now looking at my life back then, you might not have been able to figure that out because I was a punk, man. But it was in there. So with, with that being in there and, and with wanting, that, wanting it being so fresh and new and wanting to grow in my faith, we're just going to set this down right here. I don't got enough room. I got it on here. Trust me, it's from the Bible, everything I'm reading. We're going to have it up on the screens. Um, with everything being so fresh and new, being a Christian for only two years, I just wanted to get after this thing. I wanted to, I wanted to make this thing real in my life, following Jesus. So I, I dove into the scriptures. I, I really didn't read the Bible all that much in my first two years of being a Christian, but I read the Bible cover to cover because I wanted to know more about God. And I, I wanted to study apologetics, and I wanted to learn more about how to uh, reach people with the gospel because I had so many friends who didn't know Jesus, and they're getting ready to go off to college, and I'm not going to have this opportunity again to try to reach them. So I wanted to know all there was to know about that so I could reach them better. And with all this passion swirling around in my soul, and you, you might be able to relate at one point in your life to this, what I'm about to say here. With all of this passion swirling around in my soul during these late teenage, early young adult years, it led me to actions that I thought 
were going to lead me closer to Jesus, but in fact, it, it kind of drug me further away from him. I lost what it meant to follow Jesus in my heart. I lost what it meant to actually follow Jesus. And if we're using the illustration of we're going down the pathway, we're driving down the pathway of life, it should be like, hey, I'm sitting in the back all buckled up and Jesus is driving me down the road, right? But instead, these actions, this mindset that I had was I'm driving, Jesus is going to get in the back and I'm going to take us to where we're going to go. And I say all that, I lead all that up into this point to tell you that legalism kills the soul. You might be able to relate to that this morning, where you've been at a point in your life where you were legalistic, you were doing things for the wrong reasons. I remember I, I wanted to know so much more about Scripture, so instead of me getting alone in the presence of God, to be with Jesus, to be in awe and reverence of him, I began reading the Bible like a textbook to sound smart, to sound like I knew what I was talking about. Instead of caring for the poor and caring for those who are lost around me because I, I wanted to out of the abundance of my heart and compassion of my heart, it was because I was supposed to. Anybody relate to that? They've ever been to a point in their life like that? Because I was supposed to do it. I was trying to earn God's favor, favor that I already had in Christ by the things that I was doing. If your motivation for your spiritual disciplines and your work for the Lord is to keep up a good appearance before God and others, you have strayed off the path of holiness. You have strayed off the path of what God wants for you. And that's where I was. Our nature as human beings is to rely on ourselves rather than to rely on God. But that's completely opposite of what following Jesus is all about. It's not about mustering up the power and the, the might that you have to do good works. No, it's the constant wrestling and surrendering the selfish and sinful parts of our lives and giving it to him and looking more like him in the process. But we're going to get to that. I'm not going to preach my sermon, whole entire sermon right here. So... Um, that's what we're going to get after today in John chapter 15 is, is getting away from that legalistic thought, getting away from trying to work our way up to God and make ourselves look good before others and look good before the Lord and just being honest and, and abiding in Jesus and, and in the process looking more like him. So John chapter 15 is where we'll be in John chapter 15. Uh, this is actually taking place during the Last Supper. Jesus is with his 12 disciples, actually 11 at this point, because Judas has already betrayed him and fled. And John, at the end of John chapter 13, we get John chapter 14. You know, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You may have heard that. And then he moves into John chapter 15. And this is kind of Jesus' final discourse uh, to his disciples in, in his present body before he goes to be crucified. So, this is important stuff he's saying to his disciples. It's stuff he wants them to remember, but it's also stuff for us as well. It says this in John chapter 15, verse 1. This is Jesus talking. I am the true vine, and the Father is the vine dresser. So when Jesus is saying this to them, that there's so much more to it that we might not even realize us reading this 2,000 years later. When I first became a Christian and I read through the Gospels, the, the question I always had, because it was so new to me, is why is Jesus always talking about plants and seeds and all this different type of agriculture? Uh, my, my in-laws, my brother and sister-in-laws, they, they moved from Bedford to Whiteford, or not Whiteford Public Schools, Whiteford Agricultural Schools. And over there, they do like 4-H and they have classes talking about like crops and stuff like that, which me going to Bedford, dude, I... I don't even know about anything like that, but it's kind of interesting to hear them talk about that, and they're so familiar with it over there, and for us, we're like city folks over here compared to that, and uh, just hearing them talk about all that, but for Jesus and his uh, disciples, they, they understood it because that was a lot of their livelihoods was crops and, and gardens and agriculture and stuff like that. That's how you survived back then. There was no Kroger or Food Town to go to. Like You had to, you had to get your own stuff for the most part. And also they understood this idea of the vine because it's something that they would have learned uh, about in the Old Testament. This, this phrase, the vine, it was used a lot of times in the Old Testament. Jeremiah chapter 2, uh, God describes Israel, God's people, as the vine planted by God, but they strayed 
the wrong way apart from him. And in Isaiah as well, it's always a negative connotation when the Old Testament uses the term the vine. And if Jesus knew the phrase the vine was a negative connotation in Scripture, why would he use it here? Why would he use it here? Jesus uses it here because he's trying to show them and show us that the old way of doing things is not going to work anymore. There's a new covenant coming. It's not the old covenant of the the law of Moses and trying to follow the law and trying to earn our way up to God. No, it's, it's grace now. It's by grace that we have been saved through faith. And that's what they're going to begin to see when the new covenant is established, when Christ goes and dies on the cross and is resurrected and establishes this new covenant. There's a new vine, the old vine, trying to work your way up to God and and, and doing things to get peace with God will not work. I am the new vine, Jesus says. I am the new way. Follow me. And by this, he's also saying that we need to get our eyes off of ourselves and onto him eyes off ourselves and onto him. It's when we are the most focused on ourselves that we are the most miserable and sinful and selfish. I mean, you see that nowadays. Our culture just nonstop, focus on yourself. Prioritize yourself, worship yourself. You are the most important thing in your life. And we wonder why we are the most anxious and depressed generation in history. But we have pages all centered on ourselves. And hey, I have social media. I'm not saying that. But when we are just so focused on ourselves, it leaves us broken. And we wonder why. And Jesus is just pointing this out. Hey, get your eyes off yourself and get them on me. Verse number two says this. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit fruit. We know that from verse one, it says that God, the father is the vine dresser. Jesus is the vine that makes it all possible. But what are the duties of the vine dresser? Because I don't know about you. I'm not a gardener. Like we have plants in our home that I didn't even know existed until like three weeks ago. And if I was responsible for them, they would be dead. Like straight up. Any guys relate to that? Like we don't take care of the plants. Like the little succulents, like why do those even exist? Those are so dumb. Just offended like half the room, but that's all right. <laughs> but we, I don't know anything about plants, man. Like, I, I, I don't know anything like that at all. But I looked up, thank you to the Google machine, uh, what a vine dresser does. And basically what a vine dresser does, they're, they're just in charge of managing the vine and, and making sure that it's growing. And, and we'll, get, we'll see here in a second, pruning it so that it cuts out the dead parts so it grows even more and bears fruit. So when we repent of our sin and turn and trust to Jesus as our Savior, man, he is the vine that makes it all possible. That's when new life comes, when we trust in Jesus. But God the Father is the vine dresser who who is managing our lives and shaping us and molding us into the image of his Son. Now the term bear fruit, what does that mean? Sounds like some new like tropical smoothie $9 thing you get in Lamberville over there. But it's not that. Bearing fruit... Uh, in a biblical sense, means the evidence of salvation within a believer's life. Like evidence that Jesus has changed your heart, and you can see that. And we see that from the physical evidences of our lives, man. Like the things that we do now that we're a Christian because we are a Christian, and things that we don't do now because we're a Christian, like those constantly changing things in our lives. But it's not only that. It's also, it's deeper than that. It's the desires deep down in your heart, the establishing of affections and love for Jesus. And because of those affections and love for Jesus, it flows into the other parts of your life. So you stop doing the certain things that you're doing and you start doing some things that you weren't doing. Like we talked about in the beginning, man, you can be a morally good person. You can do all these things that you think will make you holier, make you holier in the sight of God and other people, but you will completely miss out on what Jesus has for your life if you're not doing it for the right reasons. And you will miss out on the joy that he has for your life. It's the condition of your heart that flows into the action, not just the action itself. And then Jesus says, every branch that does not bear fruit will be taken away. 
And you'll see later on that, that Jesus, uh, in a couple of verses later, he's referring to us as the branches. But when he's talking about this here, I don't believe he's talking about us as the branches. He's talking about the branches of our life, the, the fruit of our life, the, the, the things that are, are sprouting out of our life because of how we've been changed by Jesus. And when I read that, I think, does that mean that he's going to get rid of those branches? He's just going to get rid of me if, if I'm not following Jesus and loving Jesus and obeying Jesus like I should? Is he just going to be done with me? Is he going to get rid of me? That's not what he's saying here. He's saying he loves us so much that when we are going off that path, he's going to find that branch that's leading us that way towards sin, and he's going to rip that bad boy out. Because he loves you and he wants what's best for you. Then Jesus mentions the idea of pruning here. Like I talked about earlier, it's, it's removing the dead parts of a vine so that more fruit can grow. And that's what he's referring to here. One of the most common misconceptions about the Lord is that he is a cosmic party pooper. That he doesn't want us to have fun. He doesn't, he doesn't want that for us. But if you understand the, the weight of sin and the weight of what that does to a person and what it does to other people, you would understand that God is a loving father who just wants to protect his kids, right? There are things in our lives that we would consider fun or exciting or not a big deal, right? Right? But God knows where that leads. He, he, he knows everything. Man, like I'm 27 years old. God's eternal. He knows better than I do. He knows better than you do. Right? How many of you have kids in this room, right? Parents, okay. Uh, how many of your kids think they're smarter than you? Okay, yeah. All right, we're honest in here, right? So our, our girls, I have three daughters. Uh, two of them are almost two. And we're kind of in the stage where they're just like learning to, I mean, they're just not just sitting there anymore. They're running down the hallways doing a bunch of crazy stuff. And especially there's two of them, same age, they just get into so much trouble. So for them, it's like I constantly feel like me and my wife, Kenzie, are just telling them like, dude, don't smack your sister, newborn sister in the face. Like we're going to have to get this kid a helmet and rubber, or wrapper and bubble wrap, man. Like, come on. Or, or get your hands out of the toilet. Get your hands out of the garbage. Like, it's just nonstop. And I know it's only going to get worse from here when they get into the teenage years and all that. They're not going to listen to me, right? You parents know. But does that stop you as a parent from telling your kids what to do? Like, when you know what's best for them. Like, like I'm not going to let my kid run out on the road because they want to run out on the road, right? Like, you know what's best for them because you're their parent, and you love them, and you have way more wisdom than they do. I know, kids, you don't like hearing that, but you, one day you will find out. It's true. It's true. We, as parents, we protect, we encourage, we correct, we command them towards obedience because we know what's best for them. And I have a little story about this. Growing up, I'm the oldest of four boys. I have a brother that's about two years younger than me, five years younger than me, and I got one that's about ten years younger than me. Um, and we, we lived back in the woods for most of my, my time growing up, and we were big into, like, airsoft. We'd hunt. We'd fish. We'd ride four-wheelers. My dad had this sweet, like, dirt bike track that we'd just run through in the woods. It was amazing. I loved growing up there. It was awesome. Uh, but being hunters, we, we, we uh, I, I don't really hunt very much anymore. I don't have time for that right now. But we, we were big bow hunters. So we had the compound bow. You know, you pull it back like this. And I, would, I was fairly accurate, like at least 15% of the time I'd hit the target. Like that's, that's where I was. Um, but my dad, one year, he got all four of us, all three of us, my five-year-old brother shouldn't have been shooting it, uh, a crossbow. If you know what a crossbow is, like that bad boy's got a sight on it. You don't miss with a crossbow, right? Uh, and we had this grand idea, man. We, we had this basement. Um, you can see where this is going. Uh, we had this basement where you, where you go down in the basement, it kind of stretched all the way across the house, and the way that there was this long hallway, and the way that you would get down into the basement is you would plop yourself right into the middle of the hallway. And us four boys and my dad uh, were like, let's just make this a crossbow shooting range. This is going to be great. This is a great idea. So we put the, the target, we had two targets so it wouldn't go through the wall, uh, on this side, and we would shoot on that side, and we just had a grand old time. And it was, you know, it was cold outside, it was past hunting season, so we, we, we just brought it inside. And I remember my dad telling me, like, Josh, I need you to watch Brandon. 
you're, you watch Brandon, because we're going to go down here. I'm going to take your brothers. We're going to go shoot down here. Watch Brandon upstairs. And I said, yeah, whatever. I had my little, you know, LG Cosmos flip phone. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody? This is before every single teenager had an iPhone. I got one, like, junior year of high school. And uh, I was, like, 15 at the time. My brother Brandon was, like, five. And I just remember, like, yeah, whatever, Dad. It'll be fine. So I was just texting my friends or whatever. And then a couple of minutes later, I hear a scream from downstairs. And I assumed the worst, man. I was like, oh, no, what just happened? And I, I, I rushed downstairs. And, and luckily, by the grace of God, my brother Brandon, he's a senior in high school at Bedford, still alive, did not die. Um, but he, he ventured himself downstairs, plopped himself right in the middle of our little uh, crossbow range. And my brother, my other brother, had the safety off, finger in the trigger, ready to shoot. And he told me after that, and I hate telling the story because I could have had my brother killed. Um, but he told me the crosshairs were literally right on him. Like he was ready to shoot. My dad pushed it out of the way right in time. But man, he was ready to shoot. You, that would have been, you would have killed him. You would have killed him. That would have been on me. And I think about that story. And I think it's a good illustration because like, we, we just think we know better than God. Like I thought I knew better than my dad. I, I thought I knew better. I thought everything would be fine. I thought I didn't have to really watch my brother. But I did. And God, in the same way, man, he knows so much better than we do. We, we think we're smarter than we think that we can kind of work our way and muster our way and, and, and make our own will for our lives and just bring God along with us. But that's just not how it works. We have to trust and obey him because he knows best. All right, verse number three. From this point on, we're just going to kind of fly through some verses and we're going to spend a little bit more time on some other verses. So Jesus says this. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Jesus is reminding his disciples and us here today that if you are in him, you are clean. He has made you clean. If you have trusted in Christ as your Savior, you have repented of your sin, you are following after him, maybe not perfectly, but you are following after him, man, you're clean. The Bible says, Romans 5, man, you have peace with God because you have been justified. Romans 8, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why does Jesus remind them and us that we are already clean before God? Because yet again, it is in our nature to try to work our way up to God and try to justify ourselves before him. They would want to resort back to the, the following of the law and trying to, to, to earn God's favor doing that. And this type of thinking just messes with us, man, because even if we do understand the gospel intellectually, we don't always understand it with our heart every single day, with the way that we live and, and, and living in the grace of God. We forget it with our hearts. Verse 4 says this, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in in me. And this is, this is kind of the title of my message, just abide. Super simple. This is the key word here about this verse. The word abide. Abide is just another word for remain. And what, what Jesus is saying is remain in me. Remain in my love. It's a reminder to remain in Jesus, the pursuit of his love, and to abide in him. And by reading through this verse pretty quickly, uh, not taking the time to really meditate over it, you might miss something that's super important here. Not only does Jesus command us to abide in him, but it says that he has abided in us. And it's a mutual abiding. A lot of times we, we think about our walk with Christ. We think that if we mess this thing up, God is going to kick me to the curb and he is done with me. But that's not the basis of what our salvation is. I just have to abide in Jesus, and if I don't do this thing perfectly, God is going to be disappointed in me. But this verse shows us, no, Jesus is on your team. Like, he is for you. Ephesians 1 uh, says that we are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. God dwells inside of you. That's how much he is with you. And we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit here in a second. He abides in you. The ball is now in our court, and we need to make a conscious effort to abide in him daily. Verse 5 says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You will do nothing without the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And I won't either. 
We will do nothing without the Holy Spirit. We might try to work God's will into our life. We might try to look holy. We might try to do all these things, but nothing spiritually is going to happen if we are working apart from the Holy Spirit. Why the Holy Spirit, though? Because Jesus describes him as the helper, the third person of the Trinity who helps, corrects, convicts, encourages. He is the one to help us to abide in Jesus. So, like I said, we're moving quickly. Verse 6 says this, If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. This is what I was talking about earlier. This whole entire text leading up to this point here is talking about believers, those who, who know Jesus and love Jesus. And this is the serious, the, probably the most serious note in this passage of Scripture that Jesus talks about here in verse 6. This is talking about those who don't know Jesus, those who, who are not believers, who have not surrendered their life to Christ and trust in him as Savior. This is what Jesus is talking about. And this is what he's talking about, God's wrath. We don't like to talk about God's wrath a lot. We're like, ah, let's talk about the Jesus who is hanging out with all the children and super nice. But like, man, Jesus talked more about hell than he did about heaven. Do you know that? Like in the Gospels, Jesus talked more about hell than he did heaven. I don't want to sit here and dwell on that, but it's serious. We have to talk about God's wrath and what awaits those, what awaits us if we didn't have Jesus, what we deserved was eternity apart from God forever in hell. That's what we deserve. But thanks be to God for Christ. Like this is so serious. The essence of God's wrath is him handing us over to what we desire the most. And for those of us who have not chose Jesus, that's our own sin. And where does our own sin lead us? It leads us apart from God forever in hell. Our sinful nature, at its core, screams out that we don't want God. We just want his stuff. Like we, maybe we want the benefits of God, but we might not necessarily want him himself. And, and many theologians will describe hell as that exactly, a place where God isn't, or at least a place where the goodness of God isn't, or where he's not actively working in that way. That's what, that's what hell is. It's giving people what they want what we want in our hearts. But the truth of this is, this is so serious that one day all of us will die. We will all stand before God and he will not ask us, what was your church attendance? He will not ask us, did you pray a prayer when you were five years old? He won't ask you, how many Bible verses do you know? How many Christian songs do you know? How many good things did you do on the earth? He won't ask you anything that relates to that. He will ask you, what did you do with my son? What did you do with Jesus? Because the Bible says in Isaiah that our good works, you on your best day, me on my best day, our good works are like filthy rags to God. That's a crazy thought. Like us on our best day. Here you go, God. Here's some filthy rags. Like my kids, when they eat dinner, like most of it ends up on the ground. Like anybody relate? You got young kids. So I just, I have to scoop it all up with a rag. It's kind of my job is to clean it up the floor and all that stuff. It's just like, here's this rags of like eggs and grapes. Here you go, God. Like that's, that's what he's describing here. Um, that's us on our best day. So if you are here today thinking that church attendance and religious ritual, rituals will save you, I just want to wake you up and say, man, that won't save you. That won't save you. Only Jesus, trusting in him, trusting in his grace, trusting that he came and died for you, that's the only thing that can save you. Is Jesus your everything? And I don't say that to make the sincere Christian doubt their salvation. I just say that to wake you up if you think that attending church and doing good things will save you. No, it's only Jesus. It's only Jesus. Uh, verse 7. It says this, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And I could see how people could read this and it'll lead you kind of down like a prosperity gospel path, like, oh, God's a genie in a bottle and he'll give me whatever I want if I ask him. That's not how that works. This is implying here that if we abide in Jesus and, and Jesus abides in us, our hearts, they begin to change. 
Like our desires begin to change. And, and that's where the ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. It's not that we're asking selfishly for all this personal gain and all these blessings. Not that that's a bad thing, but it's like, no, God, Lord, bless me in a way that I can be a blessing to others. Lord, use me to glorify your name. God, invite me in to see how you're working and use me in that way. And maybe when we're going through trials, it's like, God, grow me in this trial. I started a new job, and I wake up at like 4 o'clock in the morning some weeks. I absolutely hate it when I wake up that early. That's like, man, Lord, I need to abide in you today, and I need like three cups of coffee because I need you to get through this day, all right? Maybe you're in something like that where, where, where work is just super early, you got young kids, or you're going through relational struggles or family struggles, raising kids, and you're like, man, Lord, help grow me during this. Help me to learn to look more like you during this situation. Continue on, verse 8 says this. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Have you ever asked the question of why in the world do I exist? Why am I here? What, what is the reason why I am, am living and breathing here in this moment? moment? I love Colossians 1.16. I know I don't have it on here, but I'm just going to paraphrase it. Uh, Colossians 1.16 says that, that we were created by Jesus and for Jesus. Like the only reason that we live is not to, it's not to have fun. It's not to, uh, to be a parent. It's not to just enjoy life. Like those are good things. I'm not saying that. But the sole reason that you and I exist is to glorify Jesus. That's it. Like that, that's our whole purpose in life is just to glorify Jesus. That's why you're created. And, and that type of thinking is so against what we, we are hearing in our culture today. Like I said earlier, worship of self, like me, 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 me. It's, I'm the most important per person in my life, and if, if you don't fit that mold to benefit me in my life, you're gone. I'm done with you. And Jesus says, no, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about him. It's only about him. So, so to glorify him, what does that practically look like in a believer's life? Like we can say glorify, let's glorify Jesus, right? That's a, that's a word we use a lot from the Bible. It's a biblical word. It's a good word. But how do we practically do that in our lives? We, we hear that word. It, it really means having Jesus be the ultimate authority in your life. My highest joy is Jesus. And seeing everything in my life as a lens through, through this book, through the Bible, Everything that I do, every single decision I make is through the lens of Scripture and what God has for me in my life instead of what I want for me in my life necessarily. So this changes the way I look at my life. My life is now about God and others, and that's, easily, that's easy to say, harder to do, right? Like we're, 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 we're in that life and we're, we're trying to get through the day. Like it's easy to say that, but like when we're uh, going through our lives, it's a lot harder to do. But that's what abiding in Jesus is all about. Last couple of verses here. Verses 9 and 10. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Some of us here today, we might have a background where we, uh, in our families, we, have, we had to earn the love of our family. Maybe a parent, maybe a grandparent, maybe our siblings, maybe a friend, maybe a spouse, maybe whatever it is, we, we felt like we had to earn their love. And that, that affects you, right? That affects the way you look at not only people, but it affects the way you look at God. And the end result, we feel like we got to work our way up to God. we got to earn God's favor because of what you might have experienced in your childhood. Because of that, we might think we need to obey Jesus in order for him to love us. And that's not what he's saying here. It's if you are obeying my commands, it's because you're abiding, abiding in my love. And if you abide in my love, you will obey my commands. It's not obey and that will prove or that will be your love for me. No, it's you love me, you're going to obey. Your heart's going to start turning towards Jesus and the things that he desires for your life. It's the idea of aligning our hearts with God. I love, I can't remember what song it is. It's probably like from 12, 13 years ago, maybe even further. Father, break my heart for what breaks yours. 
That's a, that's a lyric and a song. Father, break my heart for what breaks yours. What makes the heart of God hurt? That should make our heart hurt. What makes the heart of God happy? That should make our heart happy. And when we abide in Jesus, those things start to happen. All right, verse 11, last verse here. Jesus says this to cap it off. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. The Christian life is a life marked by joy. We, knowing the good news that we have, should be the most joyous people on the planet. Are we all the time? Not really. I'm not always. But we should be. We should be the most joyous people on the planet. The commands of our Lord are not to kill our joy, but to sustain it. And you might be in here today searching for something. You, you, you might not, not be a believer. You might, not even, you, you might not even gone to church in the last 20 years. I don't know you. I don't, I don't know your story. I don't know your situation. But you might be searching for something. And the things of this world just do not satisfy your soul. I get it, man. I was there. Come to Jesus. Like he's, he's been calling you since the day you were in your mother's womb, trying to set this up so that you would submit your life to him and follow him. Following Jesus, trusting in Jesus as your Savior is the most joyous and life-giving life that you could ever have. And for the believer in this room here today, you might not be experiencing the full joy that you could have. I don't always either. In Christ, I want you to know that you have access to the greatest joy that you could ever have in Jesus Christ. Like joy that you wake up every morning like it's the greatest day in the world. Now, there's going to be days that are going to be absolutely terrible sometimes. But it's joy that sustains you in that moment. Happiness is fleeting. Happiness is, uh, is based on circumstance. I could be happy one moment and my life could be destroyed and I won't be happy anymore. But joy in Christ isn't dependent on circumstances. Even in the worst moments, you can still have joy in Jesus. Maybe you're wondering, how can you seriously grow in your faith? Abiding in Jesus. Maybe you're so sick and tired of the boring, mundane life that you are in. Abide in Jesus. A prayer that I, I pray sometimes is, Lord, invite me in to see how you are working today. And if I'm attentive to know how the Lord is working, if I'm actually, if I'm not so concerned about myself and what's happening in my life, man, I do see the Lord working in some cool and honest and awesome ways. So maybe that's a prayer you need to pray is, Lord, invite me in to see how you are working today. No matter where you are today, the answer to all of those questions is to abide in Jesus. Remain in his love. Experience the fullness of joy that you were created for and just remain in him. That's all I got for you today. I'm going to pray and then I think the worship team's coming back out. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you just for life. Thank you that we're living and we're breathing, Lord, and that we're here in this moment. God, thank you that you sent Jesus to be the lamb that was slaughtered on our behalf. We did not deserve your love. We did not deserve your grace and your mercy, but you gave it for us. And because of that, we have access to the joy before us because of Jesus. So Lord, help all of us here today to abide in you, to remain in your love, to take every second and just to live it for you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We praise in Jesus' name. Amen.